Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists with a special guest today to answer all your gardening questions. So feel free to start adding any questions or thoughts you have into the comment box, and we'll address those today. Uh, my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist here for U of I Extension, and I'm based here in central Illinois. And we have Kelly on this week, of course, and also a special guest who we're glad to have here to talk about um, living with wildlife in particular today. So if you have questions about wildlife in your garden, this is your day to get some excellent answers because she's an expert. So Kelly, you want to introduce yourselves? Tell us what you like to answer questions about. Hello, everyone. I am back. I know you missed me from the last <laughs> episode. I took a much needed vacation, but <laughs> yes, I am Kelly Olsip and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. Um, my specialty within the team is integrated pest management, which is kind of crazy because I know how to kill the bugs, but <laughs> I really love them. So uh, I am very passionate about insects, pollinators, um, and I'm very excited about um, living with wildlife today and having that special guest on because I do consider myself an environmental gardener, um, you know, uh, and uh, I dabble in some vegetables and I'm a, you know, just like Candace and everybody else in Extension, I'm a good generalized horticulturist. Awesome. And Peggy, you want to introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm Peggy Doty. I'm up in the northern part of the state, and, and I cover Unit 2 for extension, which is Boone to Cabinogo. I'm on the environmental and energy stewardship team, uh, as far as my statewide team. And I also oversee and run the Natural Resource Education Center, kind of a unique opportunity in my world of extension, which is basically a nature center that offers environmental ed education for children through adults. Um, I think I may be on here today because I have a, a deep interest in the wildlife people interface with our human population, never reducing where you're going to, we just are constantly overlapping with, with wildlife. Uh, we tend to assume they're out to get us or they're out to make our lives miserable when really they're just living and doing what all things that plants, as you guys focus on, mm -hmm. animals, as I focus on their whole, their whole point of being in existence is to reproduce themselves and to preserve their species. It's what they do, but they aren't thinking about us the way I think we think they are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we tend, we tend to take it as like a, a personal affront to our garden. If, a, if, an, if an animal moves in and does something we don't want them to do. Yeah. Like, yeah. Caddy, Caddy Shack was a pretty good <laughs> example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, if you guys have questions, feel free to start adding those into the uh, comment box. Uh, but I know we just had kind of some general topics today and just general kind of questions that we kind of thought about ahead of time that we know are kind of popular questions that we tend to to get asked. And and of course, our colleague Ryan's not here today, but he kind of had some some questions of his own and things that that he is seeing. So um, should we start kind of hitting on some of those common questions and kind of common animals we see in the in the garden? Yeah, it might take care of many of the questions that are being thought of right now. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we tend to get very similar questions a yeah. lot of times. Um, okay, so one of the first ones here is about rabbits. That's definitely one that we hear a lot is uh, questions about uh, rabbits. Um, Ryan said that it seems to be a really good year for rabbits, meaning that there's a ton of them. So he, he was asking, um, is it an above average year for rabbit populations? And what makes a difference from year to year? Is there much difference? And then specifically, he had a question uh, about a New Jersey tea shrub that he planted and rabbits ate it to the ground. Uh, but he's seen other New Jersey teas in areas where there's tons of rabbits and no damage. So is there kind of something about new growth or young shoots that, that rabbits tend to like? So, yeah. so, so 
yeah. So first of all, we all pretty much know what a rabbit looks like. So yeah. let's forget the slide for right now because it'll just make some <laughs> people very sad. So you have to look at it from both sides. Okay. So when you build your, and I am not a gardener. Let me put that out there right away. Yeah. I'm a naturalist. Uh, everything that I focus on, the world takes care of it. I don't remember to water because native plants don't require so much. So don't don't um, get mad at Candace and Kelly for inviting me here and say she's working mm-hmm. in the garden. But we have to remember that when we build something that's beautiful and perfect, you're setting a table. These animals are overlapped. They're with, with us all the time. Even some you don't even realize. And when you set the perfect table, you get guests. Now, if you go to someone's house, you can't pick what you eat. That That's embarrassing. It's not, you're not supposed to do that. But when you get into a yard and you're a rabbit or a deer or any other animal, you're going to pick your favorite things first, right? So a rabbit's going to go through and eat those things. And they may also then have a nutritional need they're fulfilling. I don't know that, but mm-hmm. you see that choosing and, and choice stuff. If you're going to coexist with wildlife, you can't just assume because you plant it, they'll leave it alone. I have right now two New Jersey teas and pots because I'm still trying to figure out I have to get the wire and be ready. You have to you have to protect your plants till they're big enough to handle some of that nipping and cutting that will be done. We did this at a pollinator site. We wrapped it in wire. We had it ready to get those shrubs going. We had the one of the deepest winters. You know, it was like a polar vortex year a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I looked out at the garden where we, where we were at. We were in, we have a building, and the rabbits were sitting on the snow. The wire was buried, and they were taking the tops off the New Jersey tea. Mm-hmm. So we had it wired plenty, yeah. but the weather right made that yeah. an alter. You have to take all the elements into uh, into consideration. Mm-hmm. And if they want to eat it and it's not protected, there's just no stopping them unless you're there at that moment. Yeah. Good so you mean they're not eating my plant just because they secretly hate me? <laughs> <laughs> it's because they secretly have something else. But when that something else runs out, yeah. you know, yeah. that's why we get a little worried about planting something that uh, something likes, you know, or we put in a, an insect to help control an invasive. When that's gone, what are they going to eat? They're not going to quit eating. Mm-hmm. They're eating what they prefer. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. There's things at the table I make even myself. It's like, oh, I eat, I'll eat this first because I like it better. It's the same thing. Yeah, I'll do that, right? So I think you hit a really good topic, meaning, you know, if a gardener wants to, um, you know, protect the garden from rabbits and be environmentally safe, exclusion is pretty much what needs to be done. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of gardeners I talk to, I'm like, well, you can remove them. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. Right. So they have a heart. Yeah. Um, somebody's out there going, I don't care. And I, I I'll be honest, I'm they're not an endangered species, right? Rabbits are plentiful, as Ryan was saying. And yes, this is a bumper crop year, but people don't want to harm them. So the other option is exclusion and protecting your materials from them. And there's other things for them to eat. They're only going to fight so long and burn so many calories trying to get in there. You want to bury that fence a little bit. They don't dig tunnels, but they may try to wedge under a fence or pin it with garden pins, you know, down into the ground. So yeah, you need to, you need to make a little bit of an effort. Um, Removal is an option, but there's so many this year. Somebody else is going to come in from a neighboring space probably and start nibbling the same things. So why do you, why are there so many this year? Is it just because of so, the bringing in the word? There's always every, uh, everything comes into play, weather, everything. But what happens is, as you know, rabbits can reproduce multiple times a year. So if the weather's perfect, you don't have losses, you know, small animal loss. Um, there is a thing in wildlife without going into grave detail, but it makes sense. Prey numbers go up. So this winter, every hawk and owl that is of any good health at all will survive the winter because mm-hmm. there's so much food. Yeah. But as they eat all that food, and next year the gardeners are like, oh, thank gosh, there's not as many rabbits. Well, there's not as many breeding rabbits because, but now we have hawks. And then I get the phone calls about hawks bothering chickens. So mm-hmm. it's that, it's, it's a, it's that up and the other one follows. So one drops and then the next year or two later, you're going to have a drop in predators who aren't getting enough food, just like when we have really deep winters and you find all that mouse, um, the mouse debris, the mouse, you know, chew, the mice 
get in the house, they chew. They're under the snow. They're subnivian. Sub, under, and nivian meaning snow. They're under the snow layer. It's 32 degrees, but it's so deep. The owls can't see them. The hawks can't see them. They're under there reproducing all those heavy winters. So in the spring, again, all the, all the birds of prey and the foxes and the coyotes, now all of their offspring are well-fed. Numbers go up. Prey goes down. It's just that constant. And weather can have a lot to do with that. Okay. Interesting. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. I think we've had a uh, watcher question come in. So let's go ahead and do that. So if you guys have questions for Peggy, or if you have other gardening questions, add them to the comment box. But we got a good question here from Mary, and then we'll go back to some of Ryan's questions. Uh, Mary asked, could you talk about mink? Um, she has three mink, three minks this year. I know they're carnivores. Um, and she said, I'm okay with them reducing my populations of chipmunks, mice, squirrels, et cetera. But do I need to be concerned about my gardens? So far, they have been no trouble. So do mink? Yeah, not, if you think you have a mink issue in the garden, you have a, a different prey item for them in the garden. Okay, they may go after something, chipmunks, ground squirrels. They are, they are so carnivorous. Um, they're not going to sit around and eat berries. They're, they're, they're ninja stealth killers. They want meat and they want it fast. They want it. And they're, and they take bigger prey too. Um, our mink can jump up. Our, our average weight of our, of our Canada geese is 12 pounds and they'll jump up and grab them at the throat. Wow. I mean, they, just, they have no, we could use a few more mink, right? And some of our homeowners associations that are having struggles. Um, but the mink, the interesting thing about mink and um, our weasel family, if you have chickens, they will push, pull, and dig. They'll climb. I watched a mink go up a tree at the nature center one year after a chipmunk, straight up the tree. Well, it made sense. It was prey, and it was out in the open, and it, and it, I'm right by the river. They love waterways. It can be a ditch. It doesn't have to be a moving river. Um, but these guys, all the weasel family, they have, every animal has an MO when they, if they take out a a lot of people with gardens have chickens anymore. You know, it's that eating and, and home food. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they get in with the chickens and they grab one at the neck, which is their MO. But then all the other chickens start squawking and making racket. So they drop the one they took out and they grab another one. Like, no, no, shut up. And now another, and when they're done, they've taken, they've decapitated all your chickens. And then the weird thing is, we don't know why, they push them all into the corner. Like, Oops, did I do that? Okay, that's bad. <laughs> and they're all gone because they went. But because if there isn't the, the rats or the uh, mice or the chipmunks, they need meat. If you're flushing all the Canada geese out of your area, they're going to have to turn to your chicken. You know, there's all these pieces into play all the time. Hmm. But I would say I'm glad that she's open-minded and coexisting with those mink. Mm -hmm. Because if she ever gets even an inkling of rats or something horrible over excess mice, they're done. Then she's got her own little system set up. Nice. Yeah, I could take, I would take some mink in my garden for sure. <laughs> so when a homeowner's association goes, hey, we have a geese problem, we go, hey, go get a mink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just or let, yeah. If you could, it would be very <laughs> helpful because they would leave. Yeah, I was saying that. How yeah. are mink numbers? Like, do we have very many mink in the yeah, state? Yeah, mink are, mink are not considered endangered. They uh, Trappers can trap a certain number a year. They're a trappable fur-bearing mammal. Um, so, yeah, right now, they're uh, you just have to have a permit, you know, a hundred, uh, trapping permit. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay. Mm -hmm. They're very, they're very well off. <laughs> <laughs> cool, I learned something new. I didn't know anything about mink, so that's good. Uh, and Vicki commented, she said she learned a new word already, subnivian. So thanks for <laughs> adding that to the dictionary. <laughs> I just love those words that are like, oh, they make sense under the snow. Okay, I got yeah. that. Common sense, right? <laughs> Okay, keep those questions coming, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go back to some of our our questions from Ryan. And this is a question I have, too, is about moles. Mm. So uh, Ryan says he has an ongoing mole infestation, and so do I. Um, and he says they were fine when they were out in our yard. Now they've invaded a new pollinator pocket that he planted a couple years ago. So give us some control tips for moles. And maybe talk about 
moles versus voles too? Because I'm still mm-hmm. I'm not hundred percent of what's even in my yard. If it is a mole or a vole or okay, well I, I do want to share a picture of a of a mole that I have. So I'm going to share my screen for a little bit while I talk because I want you to see it. They're not an attractive animal except to other moles, right? <laughs> but you really need to. Um, this is one of those moments Candace is going to not be surprised at because she knows me. <laughs> if you ever find a mole that's not gross and decayed, but you get any, op- not a live mole, uh-huh. any opportunity to touch the, the pelt, the fur goes both ways. Unlike your cat and your dog, it, uh-huh. because of tunneling and backing up and that irritation, their fur blends and goes both directions and uh-huh. it's silk. It's the softest. Yeah, now other people don't uh-huh. want to see that either, but it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. So I'm going to share this. We have pelts at Sugar Grove Nature Center, and uh-huh. we were able to touch the the fur, and it is very soft. Yeah, okay. yeah. Can you see that that screen with the mole? Yep. yep. So what? that's cute. The eastern mole. We have two moles, but the star nose mole is very rare. So the eastern mole is your, usually your culprit, and the tunnels that you're getting are their feeding tunnels. Those are the ones they're they're going through, and you. They make enough tunnels, you may think you have a ton of animals, but really you probably just have a couple. Mm -hmm. Where they breed and sleep would be lower that you don't see in compartments. So when they're active in those tunnels is about the only time you are allowed to remove them with traps you can buy at the store. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing about moles that's difficult is healthy garden soil attracts moles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you do everything you can to get this great soil. They're not after Ryan's pollinator plants. They're after some insects in the soil. Now, where this could be a good thing is if you have excess grubs, they love grubs, okay? And those feet on the front that you're looking at, he's facing left there. Those feet dig all day, all day, all day. They just dig. They have great digger feet. And they use all the whiskers on their on their face um, to find you know, what they're looking for. They will eat worms, right? Um, And the best way for any, I'm going to stop sharing and bring us back here. The best way um, for any animal digging is to to block. If something's digging under your shed, down, but you can't just block the one space Mm -hmm. because they're going to go, wait, I can't get in there anymore. And what are they going to go do? One left or right. They're just going to move a little. So you have to make it at least twice as big. So if you have a mole tunnel, and you dig a 12 inch trench, you know, just a 12 inch wide, 12 inch deep and lay a piece of hard wire, bend it. Mm-hmm. They're gonna quit using that feeding tunnel. The problem is they're gonna hit that spot. And if you make it wide enough, they can't go left or right, but they might just go back, back, back all the way and go another direction. Mm-hmm. So they could harm your plants because they're digging if it's a new planted pollinator garden, but they're not eating roots. They may be messing with them. Now, if they're native plants, they're such good rooters, it may not be a problem, you know, big, deep roots eventually if it gets established. But the question is, do you have a grub problem? Is it just that it's good soil and you have lots of worms? You might want to figure that out before you lose your pest control. And then maybe if they eat enough this year, they won't come back because they've taken away all that reproductive source, you know, of grubs and things. Um, Yeah, it's it's not lovely if you love a lawn, right? But the best gardeners have moles because they have great soil. I will say if you would water, like if they're coming through the grass, if you'd water your lawn every day, I don't know for how long. They don't like wet soil. Okay. I was interested because I was going to ask that because I have an area of raised beds that I that tends to be kind of the only spot I do water. And I've noticed them there recently. So I was trying to decide, well, is are they there because the soil is kind of softer because it's wet? But that's... They don't it's, like it because it caves in. Okay. okay. And it's sticky. But what you might have done is flushed any insects you don't want to the top. Absolutely. Now they're going in. And that happens when we get a lot of rain. A lot of grubs will come to the surface. Um, the weird thing is some people don't know, but dogs, certain dogs, especially dogs that use their scent like hounds, they can smell grubs and they're good. They taste good. Mm-hmm. So if your dog starts after lots of rain digging up your garden in a spot, you might want to you might want to check for grubs. It's kind of weird, but I've seen it. They just love them. It's like candy comes to the surface, and they're they the dogs I saw were both hounds um, that could Peggy, smell them. I heard that they prefer the worms over the grubs, and it's not the grubs they're after; it's the worms. But just because they're carnivorous, 
Well, they come by a grub, they'll go ahead and eat it. Right, right. So it's they actually worms, prefer the worms. Yeah, worms are more prolific. We have worms. If you have a good garden, you have tons of food, but they will eliminate. And in different seasons, right? If you've done things to your yard, you were talking about environmentalist ing. Um, if you've done things where the worm population's low, but they live there, they're going to eat. They're going to come and eat anything they can find, and probably some pupa too. You know that are you know beetle pupa and things like that, possibly. But it doesn't mean you have grubs. But you want to make sure you don't before you eliminate your your pest control. I would, you know, and I know they dismantle the the sod and that's, that's our biggest issue is, you know, that's when people think, yeah. And think about all the animals we don't see that just don't do something obvious. Your voles, Candace, your voles don't dig, they burrow some, but really what they mostly do is they, they make a grass surface. It's not a tunnel. It's just a trail. And right. then what they'll do at the end, if they want to live in it, they'll take all a bunch of chewed off grass. They bite grass off they'll pile it. So you'll see this little tunnel into a pile of grass. I just I grab have, it. I must have moles then. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. But if it's an underground and the, and the dirt is heaving, you know, it's, that's, yeah. those are moles. And you can see the runs. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I would just say, you know, yes, if you have great soil, you have worms. If you're not using, you know, you know, tons of chemicals, you're going to have worms at the surface. If you have too many chemicals, they're going to go deep. And then the grubs may not, and then maybe the moles don't come. But if you have a situation where the moles need a habitat because there are plenty of them in the neighborhood, they're going to go for whatever they can. Mm -hmm. And that's, and here's a good insect question for you, Kelly, to specify. Michael asks, are grubs cicada larvae, lightning bug larvae? What all do grubs come from exactly? That's a good question. Um, the majority of it is beetle larvae, you know, your June beetles and your Japanese beetles. Um, you know, there's, you know, I, 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 I don't know if I'm knowledgeable enough to know what all kinds of grubs are in the soil, but I think that would be the majority of what's there. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to uh, also mention that I have personally had issues with voles. Now, the moles are the ones that are coniferous, and the voles are the ones that eat your tree bark during the winter, correct? You know, I don't know that, Kelly. I know the rabbits chew on it, <laughs> and the squirrels. I just had a squirrel call, and it literally stripped a two-foot by probably eight-inch around a huge limb, just peeled it, just peeled it. <laughs> it's, I don't know why you did that, but just like a beaver would for that inner bark. Mm -hmm. um, he goes, what, what was in my tree? And I said, well, let's eliminate what isn't in the tree, right? What's on the ground, but it peeled it just like a goat or a deer will peel bark. Um, the voles are big mice size wise, you know, they're not, they're not huge. Mm -hmm. So what they, if you had small woody shrubs, I would say those would be a, a perfect treat because they're, they're so soft when they're young. I don't know that they would make, do much damage on a physical large tree, because they're so small. Mm -hmm. um, rabbits, rabbits can just go crazy and chew a lot. That's when I, that's when I first learned about voles when I worked in a greenhouse and we would overwinter our, um, our young trees and shrubs in a hoop house and we were getting vole, vole damage um, on those young trees and shrubs. Now, we wow. decided that we would use the product that had castor oil in it. Mm. And so we just like kind of gradually extended the, the area of treatment. So to push them out. Mm -hmm. So that was just my personal experience. Did you put it around the plant in the soil or around the floor or area where they were being housed? Uh, we just like we just did it in the, we did it in the plants first, then we did it in the greenhouse, then we did it on the whole property. Like we gradually like we pushed heard them. that mm -hmm. if you gradually push them out, mm -hmm. um, it would be, it'd be more efficient. Nice. Long so long they were a bad. They were bad in the greenhouse. I mean, I well, they got they have cover, fresh, yeah. soft food. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, we set these tables, and then we. Don't under, you know, it's like, wait a minute, I, I didn't ask for you, right? <laughs> and um, pretty much for those listening, if you see what you think is a mouse, but then you're like, wow, look at the size of that mouse, but it's got a really short tail, that's a vole. They look, they're typically, they look very, as they're running, right? When you look at them individually, they're, they're much different. But 
if you see a very large mouse with very short tail running, that's a vole and you wanna keep an eye on those. Those also you can remove without permission from the IDNR or anyone. There's certain animals, chipmunks, 13 lane ground squirrels, um, moles, voles. Some of these you can remove without, without a, a permit. How do you remove? Well, that's up to the homeowner. <laughs> you know, most people don't want to kill things, but a lot of times it's illegal to move a lot of animals. People want to save their lives, but then they put them in a situation that can cause detriment to a healthy population of that animal. Um, you cannot move skunks or raccoons, um, things like that. So I will pop up um, before we're done today, I'll pop up the website where you can get all that information and find people that remove things for you. A lot of people want them gone, um, but they don't want to do it themselves. I truly understand that. But there are many, but you want to talk to the person removing that animal from your yard and fully understand what's going to happen so that you aren't under some, you know, fairy tale that, oh, they're going to take it to a lovely place where all the beavers dance and play together. <laughs> no, they're not. You're, it's going to be a, an extinguished situation. And they'll, a lot of people will ask you, do you want me to remove it alive? And that determines how they capture it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and we have to protect our homes. We have to protect, but we definitely don't want to set ourselves up, you know, to have this constant conflict. There was a book by Jim Sturbuck called Nature Wars, and it's, it was the whole books on just how our backyards and gardens have become battlegrounds between us and them, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't understand their behaviors. I did say one time in a, I was actually at a, a garden workshop and I said, I truly feel, the one thing I will say that I, I, I feel strongly about when it comes to coexisting and management, I get it. We need to not have $50 worth of tulips get moved to the neighbor's yard. That's not fair, right? Um, but I think that, it's really important that you know everything about whether it's an insect or a mammal or a reptile or whatever it is, I would say, please learn everything about it first because you might find a way to get it to just go away, make its life range not comfortable, its habitat. And also I don't think it's fair to salt down something or poison something if you don't understand why it's doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to reproduce. They're just trying to find the best place. We just keep providing the best places. Mm -hmm. um, and they're adapting, right? These urban animals that it used to be wild animals in open spaces are learning to adapt with us. That also bothers us. We don't like things that are smart. It freaks us out. And when they outsmart us, we get determined, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would say just no. I told a group one time, I said, you know, slugs... And snails, everybody's like, oh, it's a snail. Ew, a slug. I'm like, quit picking on the homeless, right? <laughs> That's know, not fair. Really. They don't have a calciferous gland. It's not their fault. Yeah. But I said, yes, I get it. You don't want them eating your hostas. I let them eat mine because I'm not a gardener, you guys. I didn't plant them. These hostas make me look like a gardener. I love them. If I get slugs, I look at them and I try to figure out how many different kinds. And somebody's out there going, that's ridiculous. I get it, but that's who I am. Yeah. I also get that you don't want your plants damaged, but before you salt them down, you should find out that they have sphericals that they breathe in and they exist. And what, what, where are their eggs? Maybe you should find out where they, what their eggs look like. So before you take them out or worry about them, you can wipe off the eggs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not feel as, as you know, Mm -hmm. you know, they're wiping out something. And I'm not against it. Don't get me wrong. We need to protect our food sources and our plants. But I really feel we are obligated to understand why it's doing that first, because we might figure out just how to get it to go away mm -hmm. um, and do its own thing. But don't tell your neighbors how you got rid of it. I have a, gotta go somewhere. <laughs> I have a similar mantra to you. I, I mean, we're, I think we're a lot alike, even though you're mammals and I'm insects, you know, it, with integrated pest management, complete eradication of the pest is never my goal mm -hmm. because I know that I can't do that unless I start doing these harsh chemical pesticides. So if I want to be environmentally friendly, then I have to accept a little bit of damage. And I'm right there with you. If, you know, a, a few slugs eat my hosta leaves, that just adds to the diversity of my backyard mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Like we, we do not have to have a perfect pristine looking 
plants and yard for you to be a good gardener. Mm -hmm. And um, to accept a little bit of this damage, to accept a little bit of what's going to just happen in the environment, you know, I like doing that. I don't want to always, you know, it's like with cabbage white butterflies. Think about it. We hate cabbage white butterflies, but we love monarchs. Why? Because the cabbage white eats our cabbage and our broccoli. So we think they're bad butterflies, but they're just as good as monarchs. So I, I feel I feel you. I feel the same way when it comes to insects. Sometimes I just would rather nature take its course than to sit here and put chemicals or poisons out there. Yeah. Well, I think we have to think about human sustainability. Whatever you put in your food chain, whether it's on your soil or in your garden, is in your food chain now. We have groundwater. All of our waters, you know, unless you're in a space where you're getting surface water, anything you put on your soil goes into the ground. It's you're, you're, you're putting into your space, not just going after something. So understanding all those, you know, they always say, read your labels. Um, and part of that is because you can also waste your money. More isn't always better. It just does the same amount, but you've just spent so much money because you thought, you know, more is better. Um, and more did nothing more than the amount you were supposed to use, mm -hmm. right? And now you've added that to your overall world um, with your child, uh, you know, and with your families. So it's just a matter of really, what's my one move going to do? And that's, you know, take it back. Can I live with it? I had a, a person call me one time and she said, I just saw a chipmunk in my yard. I said, oh, cool. <laughs> Not cool. cool. She was so quiet. She goes, is it cool? I said, well, that depends. What are, what are you calling me for? She goes, because I had a chipmunk in my yard. I said, what did it do? She goes, it ran by. I mean, and, and I loved it. It was the best conversation. I said, what's, what are you concerned about? How can I help you? Well, what's it going to do? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I said, how about you keep my number? And immediately, if it does something rogue, call me. Can you live with him around if he's not doing anything wrong? Well, yeah, he's kind of cute. But I didn't know we had chipmunks. I'm like, yeah, we do. And now you have your own, mm -hmm. right? And I wasn't being condescending. I'm like, and she was so, she goes, okay, so I can just leave him alone until I'm worried about something. I'm like, yep. I said, if you're lucky, if your neighbor's got good tulips, you might just get a few on your yard, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, okay, cool. But a lot of those questions are very honest. You know, what do I do? Nothing if they're not doing anything. Keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on them. Because if they go rogue, you want to be prepared so it doesn't get out of hand, right? And you want to have a plan in place. Um, but yeah, we get, I get a lot of people that I planted this from for myself, but, you know, the rabbits, you know, again, uh, are eating it. I, and why do they do that? I'm like, because it tastes good. You know, what are you, I don't, there's no underlying you know, plan of the wildlife. They don't, I, and with even with coyotes, I do a lot with with predators uh, programming. People people take it so personally. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing that? They don't know you. They just see us as a species. They don't know we care. They don't know when they howl and yip that some people don't understand. It's like the Waltons communicating. They they are. They don't know they frighten people. They're not out there going check this out. I'm going to bark. Watch Mr. Smith run in the yard. Right. They're not. That's not. But we get we anthropomorphize things because if we feel like it's personal, like Candace had said earlier. Mm -hmm. oh, man, good stuff. Good stuff. OK, let me see. I think we've gotten a question or two about squirrels. So you want to <laughs> hit on those next? You know, Ryan had a comment about um, bird feeders and kind of the. Yeah. I guess kind of the pluses of that, but then are they also drawing squirrels? So you want to kind of touch on that? So is there any well, any other specific questions about them other than the bird feeder they, thing? Let me look at what they... This they just asked how to, keep, how to keep squirrels out of the garden is what they asked in particular. Oh, I bet they're, they may be eating fruit. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, again. They, they specify, but, yeah. Tomatoes or something, maybe. Um, we get that question a bit, yeah. Oh, okay. So squirrels are a little trickier. We have a lot of squirrels. So we have chipmunks. We have the 13 line. These are all your squirrel family, right? I love that one. That's my favorite Aww. squirrel. I just you want to touch that belly, but I know it would not end well. Mm -hmm. So we have gray squirrels and fox squirrels. These are your arboreal, your tree squirrels. Um, they will chew on wooden doors. They will, they, they, they just... 
They just chew. That's their job, I think. So the gray squirrels are a little more cantankerous. Um, some wildlife rehabilitators will call them the devil's spawn because they're a little mean and they actually pick on and can run out all your fox squirrels. This is difficult because these guys aren't diggers, right? So you're fencing for squirrels on the bottom, on the ground for the terrestrial beasts, but you have a squirrel who can leap, jump, drop in, climb out. Um, so again, it's, an, it's trying to figure out why they're, what they're going after. Can you, um, if you get rotten, rotten fruit or vegetables, make sure you're putting them in a place that they have access to it, but it's not right next to your garden, right? Because you're just drawing them in with smells and everything else. Squirrels can smell a foot deep through snow to find what they want. So they're smelling food coming on. They're smelling those fresh plants. Um, as far as a deterrent, boy, that's tricky. Minus throwing something over the top and slowing it down because they are acrobats. And what I would do personally, and this, you're, it doesn't make, mean that it would work. I might go ahead. I don't feed the birds in the summer, but I might locate a bird feeder, not by my garden, and fill it full of black oil sunflower seeds because that's their favorite. Shelled, give them something to do. Make them work for it. Don't give them the ones that are open. They will fill up on the most especially, you know, we are going into fall soon and they know that. So they're loading up, right? They're getting everything they can. They cannot store a tomato. That's like a dessert, right? That's yummy. But if you provide them with a food that's highest in fat and calorie, like black oil sunflower seed, they might just say, I don't know, this is not a fact, but that's what I would personally try because I'm not going to try to eliminate my neighborhood squirrels. There's just one I like forgive me, but I love my squirrels. I actually put nest boxes up because my immediate neighbor likes to extinguish them regularly. Yeah. So I'm like, stay on this side of the world, right? <laughs> I don't garden for vegetables because my yard has grown in and it's all shade now. I can't do that anymore. Um, but I would try something like that. In st first steps, what can I do to provide you with what you're looking for, but get you out of my stuff? And at the same time, put some kind of a, a netting is going to be a mess. And I would almost be afraid that they'd get tangled in it and then you'd have a mad squirrel on your hands. But if you could make it taunt enough that it wasn't going to come loose and tangle them, it would be annoying. Mm -hmm. They might try to chew through it, but it's going to be just annoying. Um, and there may be something on the um, on the wildlife site that has other other ideas for that. But you're talking about an acrobat. Yeah. You know, America's Got Talent has nothing on what a squirrel can do. It kind of falls in line with the um, how we use trap crops in the garden. You know, for instance, if I have squash bugs, um, I may I may plant my zucchini, but then I also plant my Hubbard squash, and the most of the squash bugs will go over to the Hubbard squash, and then I just you know stomp and kill. So, I mean, you kind of doing that kind of that trap crop. I like that idea a lot. I would never want to get rid of squirrels. And if they ate a few of my tomatoes, I'd consider that just, you know, collateral damage. Right. Well, but usually you have so many tomatoes that it's, it's yeah, it's just one of the, of the bunch and you've got plenty more to go. So and if you not, did put up some fencing that made it a little bit more difficult and took the ones that they already chewed on or that are, buggy or just not well and put them outside where they could just get to them and not work for it they would go for the easiest you know access yeah. as well um let me see michael had a question here where do uh the flying squirrels fall in the red gray etc the flying squirrels are arboreal so they're a tree squirrel we they're nocturnal and they they have a habitat that's very specific they really like an, an a fully mature oak hickory habitat um, they can have a, a, a lower forest layer, uh, shrubby layer, but they really like those almost um, savanna style, um, you know, a savanna type habitat, lots of open to move, to fly. They don't fly, they glide. Um, and they are, the interesting thing, I love these guys, they nest like a typical mouse rodent, because you know, our squirrels are rodents. If you, they live near your home, and you put out, say, an old pillow or something, they'll rip it and take the stuffing and mix it with oak and hickory leaves <laughs> and make this elaborate, lovely, cushy place. The thing that's beautiful, they have a place to sleep. They'll have another tree that they'll just pack full of food for the winter. 
and they'll use a different tree for the bathroom. I love that they're so tidy. <laughs> and, and I always tell the kids I teach, I'm like, they never go to the bathroom in their bedroom or the kitchen, you know, to <laughs> do that. Um, but yeah, they're there. And the flying squirrels, boy, if you can get sight of one, I've seen two in my whole life and they're beautiful. Again, they're very silky. And if you ever get to see one, you'll notice their eyes are massive because they have to take, use their rods and their eyes to take in as much light as they can. But it's, they're, they're flying kites. They, they're furry kites. They don't have flying control. The only mammal we have that can fly are bats. A truly true flight. But they can glide. But, at, you know, on a windy night, how accurate are you? But when they land on the ground, they can run like any other squirrel. So they have a lot of tools in their toolbox. That's pretty cool. Yeah. They love, they love awesome. acorns. Just love acorns and hickory nuts. So if you have yeah. those or you think you have a, a squirrel and you want to see them at night, you can load your bird feeders up with some extra hickory nuts and stuff. They'll come to bird feeders, but only at night. Okay. Well, and that was, that was kind of Ryan's question regarding squirrels. He says they have a, a ton of bird feeders, some outside their kitchen window, uh, but he's finding that some of the excess seed, you know, that drops to the ground doesn't get eaten has created some mice problems. And he said the squirrels are constantly raiding those mm -hmm. feeders. So, any strategies for, I guess, keeping the squirrels out of it? Is a certain type of bird seed better or do you just kind of live with it if you're going to have yeah, a Yeah, well, it's kind of like I tell people, why don't you start feeding the squirrels instead and then you'll be really happy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of feeding the birds. Sure. So it, it's difficult because, you're again, you're setting a table. And how do you set a table in an open environment fairly and choose who gets to eat there? Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a diversity thing. It really is because we choose, we want to feed the birds because we're enamored with flight and with poetry, you know, the bluebird of happiness. And then these cute furry beasts come in that you don't like. And it was really, I grew up with um, very related to farm culture. We had a soil testing lab in our backyard and I, you know, they're rodents. Squirrels are just another rodent and I get it. They are a rodent actually, right? But they love um, to eat and survive and keeping them out of your feeders could be a never ending battle. The thing I would ask people not to do is don't, don't trap them and move them to a whole new location, not fair. Just go online, get a legal permit. You can get a nuisance permit from the IDNR and then remove them yourself, but you have to be willing to destroy them, right? So you have to put your heart in there too and figure out what you're willing to do or have, you can hire a professional We'll, and we'll be showing you that website at the end. Um, and there's going to be highs and lows just like rabbits for numbers. I have so many squirrel. Uh, I've had so many squirrel broods in this yard this year, gray and fox squirrels. And there's a lot of them. So far, I haven't found anything. And I have a chipmunk. Um I don't, I don't know what they're eating, but they're happy going wherever they're going to get food, you know, nuts and stuff and bringing them back. I know I've seen a walnut here and there and I don't have a walnut tree and peanuts. My neighbor feeds peanuts year round. So I got a lot of peanuts in the yard. Um, exclusion is difficult. Coexistence is easier. Um, but if you, if you remove them, do it legally, you know, that way you have to think about it a little bit. And there's not a bird, there's very few bird feeders out there. But if it's also your hobby, it also, I know I have friends that are um, like my dad's age and it, it's their whole winter of how to, you know, caddyshack these squirrels and come up with ways and I figured it out, you know, and mm -hmm. that's not horrible. That's, that's a lot of brain power right there to figure it out. I did have a gentleman who said, I catch them and I take them away. I said, well, really, it's not okay to do that. He goes, well, I spray paint their tail. And I'm like, what? can you tell me why you do that? He goes, I just want to know if it's the same squirrel coming back. And I said, you're taking him 10 to 15 miles away. Yeah. And I said, he goes, but there's always so many squirrels. I'm like, and that's the point. If you take out squirrels, there's more. Yeah. You're not going to, you don't have a yeah. parameter. They yeah. Have the habitat. They're going to come. Unless you have a massive fence that's, that's full voltage, mm -hmm. you can't take anything out of your yard permanently without something moving in to replace it right? Because you have a table set full of food. They have no clue that, that that's not for them. They're not, hey, you know. Hey, Peggy, why don't we not wait till the end? Why don't you show that website sure. right now? So if 
Um, Peggy has a website um, where you can find some of this great information that she's talking about. Um, if you have questions about other uh, mammals in Illinois, there you go. So that what used to be our living with, if you used to go to our living with Illinois wildlife or living with wildlife in Illinois, I, mean, I can't remember now we've changed it. This is the new website. You can still go the other route and it'll take you to this website. But this wildlifeillinois.org has all the same things the old site had. <clears throat> and you can pick the animal. You can pick by damage that you're seeing to figure out what animal made the damage. You can look at frequently asked questions. They have Illinois conservation laws. So you know if you can you know, take something out on your own or if you have to get a permit. Um, and they'll also have contacts statewide for professionals who remove uh, animals for you. Um, but again, make sure you understand what's happening and how that'll work out for you. The other thing I want to remind people, and they're... Um, wildlifeillinois.org. I'm going to go back. I had it. stop sharing that again, and I can put it up at the end again, too. Yeah. We've got it in the comments, too. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so every state manages their wildlife. Illinois has full management over mammals, fish, um, freshwater mussels, reptiles, amphibians. They do not have control of birds. Birds are, birds are in the hands of the federal government. You have to be very careful if you get mad at a woodpecker and you happen to have someone nearby that notices that you did something to that woodpecker in there and a person who's concerned about that because it's illegal to harm any, any bird due to the Migratory Bird Act, uh, depending on the animal, the Endangered Species Act. The only three birds that aren't protected are the English house sparrow. It's a weaver finch. It was brought over... Um, they thought we were going to make pets out of them. That didn't work out so well. So they let them all go. They tried, I think, two or three times. It took like three times to get house sparrows to take in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But they kept trying. And we <laughs> have them. The European starling brought in to eat cutworm. When the cutworm's not there, what do they do? They go after our native birds and nests and eggs and babies and destroy things, right? Mm -hmm. And the rock dove, which is the most beautiful name for your typical farm pigeon, Mm, it's okay. a dove. It's a rock dove brought in to replace uh, the squab of the passenger pigeon as a food source. Mm -hmm. Those three, you can do whatever you want anytime. Those three aren't usually making the biggest problem unless you are a birder and you have bird boxes and they're destroying uh, babies as they're born or eggs. So birds are protected flat out. Just know you can't, you cannot legally do anything. You could get a hold of the IDNR on the website, on the wildlifeillinois.org web website and say, I have a woodpecker destroying my cedar-sided house. They're going to ask you to try to do other things like flashy mylar things, netting from the top of your house and just pin it to the ground, different things. Um, and I don't even know if they would ever let you legally remove something like a woodpecker. We only have seven species in the state, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to... Uh, they're losing habitat like crazy. So we don't... I don't know what their answer is going to be at the time that you might need it. But... Be really careful with birds. We had someone who had starlings and they knew they could get take care of them. It was on a farm and they were cleaning up fresh grain, you know, planting grain, and then they were pulling it out of the ground or off the ground, whatever it was. So they put out a poison bait and a migratory bird flock came through and ate it. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't always target what you're after without a lot. Again, know your animal and know what you're doing and also know... You know, it's kind of hard to hide a few hundred dead migratory birds. Yeah. And there's a fine involved, and it's a federal-level fine, not a state-level fine. Mm -hmm. So that's really important with birds and food in your garden to know that. Yeah. So the house, name of those three birds, again, are? English house sparrow, the European starling, and what we know as the pigeon, the common pigeon. It's, it's a rock dove. Those three do what you want, but everything else has um, is protected. Um, things that even squirrels are protected because we have a hunting season. Hunting seasons are are because they are food um, for people. Still, people still. When I did my wildlife degree back in the eighties, eighties, <laughs> um, I did wildlife management, and we we practiced wildlife management and learned different styles of wildlife management to sustain wildlife in a managed. Con 
you know, consideration for people who were feeding their families or using the pelts as a supplement income, we've changed so much, Mm -hmm. you know, than from where we were then. Um, Now we manage people as much as wildlife. And I don't mean that in a controlling way, but we have to talk to people to help them understand what's going on so they can make really good choices for themselves and for the animal if, if they can. People have to be here. We just have to realize how much control we do have and that a shovel can plant something and it can cut it right out of the ground, right? So we have a lot of power. So uh, Peggy, I wanted to show you something I have in my office and uh, I actually have been getting lots of questions about this lately. Mm -hmm. And so I have this um, box, a master gardener actually gave this to me. Mm -hmm. If you look. Oh, yeah, you can see inside there. Yeah. Cool. And um, so uh, what I, I identified it as a bald-faced hornet nest because, um, you know, uh, just comparing it, just, you know, doing my research and finding out what how, how these different um, wasps build their nest, this is what I found, that it's the papery gray, and they have the hexagonal uh, uh, nest cells in there. So uh, that's uh, cool. That's huge. A really cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All shaped. Isn't it crazy that they do all that and then completely abandon it? Yes. Because it's organic matter. It can't, right. it won't be in any shape by, by spring going yeah. through winter, but they do all that and they have to chew and spit that all out again. Yes. That's a so, lot. If you were to find this on your property, you know, I would just leave it alone because all Mm -hmm. these worker uh, wasps will die over the winter. Mm -hmm. So um, I just thought it was really cool. Do you get a lot of questions on wasp nests? I get a lot of wasp nests delivered to the nature center because (laughs) they're beautiful. And and the people that see the artisticness, it's, it's just amazing. I have one that has pink in it stripes of pink because we have a lot of uh, blackberry they do that in the spring you know they're chewing they'll chew on wet wood on on a deck um and then any kind of plant material because your deck is made out of a past tree um but i have one that has this pink and this cream so that whatever plant they're chewing on at the moment which makes you realize when they're chewing they're they're chewing on one item and then they have to go back and put that on they don't have like a suitcase to carry it in right and so when there's consistent color, it's because they're getting something each trip is a different piece, something they went and got. Mud daubers, when they make mud, uh, dauber nests on the house or somewhere, it's cool because if you get rain and you have a gravel road anywhere nearby, the next layer is this pale, creamy <laughs> gravel road color. And then they, you know, they pick and you can see the different, I think it would be fascinating to do soil tests on those, you know, break it <laughs> apart. And figure out how far are they going, yeah, if, where if far from. at all, and compare it to the forest soil, the prairie soil, the, the river, you know, and do all that. I don't know. I think it's a nerd. It's a nerd world here, folks, right here. <laughs> We're in the right place, right? Um, Kelly, Mary asked, she said she loves the wasp nest. Um, so there's not any mites or anything else that might get into your house if you bring that nest in. Would you recommend bringing it inside? Probably not. Well, I would think after the winter, I would think everything would be dead. Yeah, probably. Um, I've not had any problems. This was a gift from a master gardener. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe if you, uh, you know, killed them and brought it in, you might have some problems. But I would think after the winter, yeah, you're so. good. And that's the other thing. If they're not bothering you and you see it as the leaves start drying and you go, whoa, I didn't see that up there. They've been there all summer Mm -hmm. and you didn't know it. Yeah. So don't make it your target job to get it down. Let it be. They're going to leave. I get them in the fall and they're already empty um, early winter before they've even wintered over. So just remember that it wasn't just put there yesterday. Excuse me. And you've been living with them there. You've been walking under it, sitting, playing with the dog, kids, whatever. So be don't go right on to us and them, right? I would only control it if it was like in my door or, you know, maybe, you know, uh, right outside my deck or in my garage. Other than that, I would never control them. 
Yeah. I would because they're, they're pollinators. I well, and they're they're garden. they're super docile, but you know, if somebody starts banging on my house, I'm going to get a little aggravated too. <laughs> Oh. Unlike yellow jackets, yellow jackets, they are they just get frustrated. They're the most aggressive. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you guys, it's live and I have a dog. <laughs> we, did a, we almost made it. <laughs> okay, we've got about five minutes left. So I'm going to scroll back up. I know there's at least one more question I want to hit, and then we can kind of finish off with any final thoughts, Peggy, because sure. I think we can talk for hours on this. I think. So um, before that, we yeah. um, our next show is August 26th. We're going to be talking about rain gardens. Yes. So be sure to put that in your calendar. Yeah, August 26th, we have another special guest talking about rain gardens. And also, don't forget, too, we have that um, horticulture group now on Facebook, and we'll put a link in for that. So if you have questions or pictures you want to post and ask questions, you can join that group and ask them at any time. And our, our group of educators will address those. So, nice. um, okay. I've got one last, last question from Erin earlier. She asked, how can I get more worms and toads in my garden? Worms like good soil, less chemicals, right? Because they're very sensitive. Um, so just upgrading your soil, you know, uh, health. Because, and the nice thing, once you get worms, they have um, like red wigglers, you know, they have, they put 8% more nitrogen out than they took in out of your soil and break in different organic matter. They also have calcium. They have a calciferous gland, worms add calcium. And um, so, yeah, you if you don't want blossom end rot, and I did solve that this year, that's good for this um, group because I always talk about vermicomposting. I love vermi worm worms for, com especially in the winter because I don't like going outside mm -hmm. in the way back in the corner of my yard. And I found a bucket when I was cleaning the garage. I'm like, why would I save dirt? Well, it's me, right? Kelly and I would see that. <laughs> and I'm looking at it and it's super consistent. I'm like, oh, this is worm castings. Mm -hmm. I had saved it from my worms. And I planted uh potted tomatoes this year and I literally moved them since we're home I planted them and I move them into the sunny spots they were doing great but they got blossom end rot and that's from lack of calcium you know soluble calcium you can't just throw eggshells on there so I'm like aha I preach this does it work I put it on there I watered it into all four pots I picked all the all the um, bad ones off and there were a few I wasn't sure they did have it I picked them up I have no more end rot nice Worm composting. So I'm going to be doing that in November, if I may, um, on, our, on our webinar on wormy composting. It worked. It wasn't just what somebody, I, I'm not that I didn't believe it, but. Um, and that has a lot to do with cal with uh, consistent watering too, because yeah. calcium is unable to transport throughout the plant. So, um, yeah. you know. Uh, Great. You know, you want to have that calcium available to the plant, but if you're not consistently watering, you'll also it's, it's get there. it mm -hmm. regardless of how much you have in the soil. Yeah. Nice. Well, I, I'm probably watering better because I know I put my worm casting on there. Good right. Job. So doing it all get it in. Yeah. And you want that, I'm not a gardener. <laughs> you want that caprese salad, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Candace, did you ask me about toads? Oh yeah. yeah. So they asked about worms and toads. Yeah. You know, it's hard to control getting toads. I have a bumper crop of toads this year. I'm so excited, but right now with the heat, they tend to go under things and hide in the spring. I had, um, nine to a dozen every night between the front and the backyard. Pesticides are hard on them. Herbicides are hard on them. They're amphibians. They absorb everything through their skin. Providing them with a moist patch of dirt every night is helpful. They'll dig down in there and you'll find them there in the morning. If you want to see if you have toads, provide them with, uh, I just used some peat moss and I just have it in a little tray and I wet it every night. And sure enough, if they're not right now, cause it's hot, um, they'll use that and they'll dig in and you'll, in the morning you'll see all these little either holes where they were, or they'll be still in there. So then you can kind of figure out how many you have. Very oh, good. that's a nice, cute trick. Yeah. Okay. And I think we had one final question too, that I'll get to more of a gardening question. Um, Vicki asked earlier, um, she has some new raised beds and it sounds like maybe some herbicide drift or herbicide damage. She's doing some soil tests. Uh, but her question is, if I have to start all over and empty the boxes, how do I decontaminate the boxes for next year? So Vicki, a lot of that will depend on what the herbicide was and how long it stays in the soil, essentially. So if you're able to identify what kind of herbicide it was, what kind of damage you have, that would be the place I would start. Kelly, would you concur? Yeah, and so here in Extension, we don't address herbicide damage for 
reasons you can probably uh, understand. So what we do is we send everybody to USDA and they might be able to help you out and help you, you know, identify um, what could have possibly happened. Um, Another thing that may, you know, uh, some kind of screen, plant screen that might, you know, protect some of those vegetables, um, that food crop in the future. Yep. Good tips. Yep. Very good. Okay. Peggy, any final, anything we missed that you want to touch on? No, just learn what's, why it's there. It's there because it has what it needs. And if you really want to get rid of it, learn about it. And you, if you can just break up that life range, some requirement, are they coming because you have a bird bath? Are they coming because um, it's really quiet? You know, raccoons will leave if you play, you know, um, talk radio 24-7, throw a radio outside under a tub, let it just mumble away, they'll leave. But once you know that, you can get rid of things you don't want and or at least make it more a uh, little easier to coexist with what's there. Just learn before you decide something is bad. Yes, my least favorite question when people find out I'm into insects is, what is this insect and how do I kill it? <laughs> and I'm always like, you don't even know if it's good yet and you're right. already planning to murder it, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I, li- I like that. I like, you know, we, co- you know, I like having a diverse backyard if Squirrels come in. I'm happy. I okay. love the squirrels. I always tell people, Hassan Pfeffer is a dish for real. So think about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Peggy. We appreciate you being on and sharing Thanks all for your having me. expertise. Uh, you're amazing. Love. I love all the stuff we talked about today. Um, we will be back on August 26 with rain gardens as our topic that day with another guest. Um, person. So join us then. Check out the Horticulture Group. And thank you, everybody, for your questions this week. We will see you next time. Happy gardening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.